welcome back, everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speakers, Ivana um, Pavel Benchik and Lukasz Bakura, um, from the Adam B. Kiev uh, University in Poland. And they're both uh, a project that they've been working on together for some time. Um, Joanna is the Associate Professor of Sociolinguistics at the uh, University in at the Adam University in Poznan, Poland, and her primary uh, research focuses on language and gender and discourse of psychotherapy. She's recently published uh, she's published in a range of international journals, and um, she will talk about this um, British on the project. Wukash is a PhD student and researcher in the Faculty of English and a member of the Gender Studies team at the Adam Bickley-Bayes University in Poland. His research interests include language, gender and sexuality, identity and educational settings, um, crystal metalexicography, and identity constructions. So um, without further ado, I'll hand over to them. Um, okay. For their, so they have 20 minutes, and then we'll be 10 minutes at the end for questions, and then we move on to our next speaker. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, John, and it's, it's a great pleasure for us to be here, and I'd like to express our uh, gratitude to uh, both Sorry. Mel and John. Uh, and Mike. And Mike, <laughs> yes, and Mike as well. Okay, I'll try to speak up, yes, uh, for um, inviting us here, but also for giving us an opportunity to attend mm. some of the other seminars where we really mm. um, were able to access a lot of uh, information and knowledge that uh, we did not really know that, that existed. Um, I'd like to also mention Jane Sunderland uh, from Lancaster University who participated in the project. She was our principal investigator and also a, a co contributor to our today's talk. Now, in this uh, uh, talk today, we'll be reporting on some of the findings that we have uh, managed to um, get from a project that has been funded by the British Council entitled Investigating Gender and Sexuality in the ESL Classroom, Raising Publishers, Teachers and Students' Awareness. And even though there is not a mention of Poland or Polish in the title, this is the kind of context that we are interested in. But more specifically today, we'll talk on uh, I Only Teach English, a quote that I'll get back to in a moment, Gender and Sexuality Made Irrelevant, Relevant in the Polish EFL Classroom. So this is our research team. I mentioned Jane Sunderland. Um, there's also Batwomi Kruk and Alexandra Sokolska-Bennett, our research assistants. And the project has a website, so if you'd like to access more information and also see what kind of output we managed to get from the project um, and also uh, kind of generally see what we have done, uh, please feel more than welcome to go there and, and have a look. So in the project, we look at a, a broad range of context uh, as far as EFL context is concerned. Uh, we started with uh, examining a number of textbooks at uh, three different levels because the project look at what is happening in the context of primary, secondary, and also high school. We also uh, look at um, classroom interactions. So we uh, did a little bit of ethnography here. Then we also conducted uh, two types of focus groups with teachers and students, uh, as well as interviews with the official reviewers employed by Ministry of Education to get their perspectives as well. Now, one thing that we were trying to bring into the project, um, focusing on the EFL, is the knowledge that has already been um, sort of accumulated and the type of research that has been done in the area of language and gender studies because it seems to us that to a great extent the EFL context kind of lags behind and a lot of you know notions and methodologies that have been commonly used now in language and gender studies do not really feature prominently in the EFL context thus uh, a, a range of qualitative methods broadly defined again discourse analysis but also feminist critical discourse analysis and uh, the study has also been framed by critical pedagogies and queer linguistics. So now I only teach English, what does that mean? What's the significance? Now when we're trying to access a number of schools and we talk to the uh, teachers introducing the project without using the word gender or sexuality, and Ukash will talk about it, why not? We talk about uh, the fact that we are interested in the portrayal of men and women in, uh, in the textbooks. We often uh, heard from the teachers that actually, you know, there's nothing interesting going on because I only teach English, so there's nothing in it. So, you know, it sort of stayed with us, the sort of slogan, I only teach English. And of course, the project showed clearly that there is much more going on because every teaching and every learning is a social act, is a social process. And there's, of course, a lot of teaching 
both explicit but um, mostly implicit when it comes to uh, gender categories. A lot of it entails non-negotiability of gender categories as well. So this is what we're going to talk about. Briefly, we'd like to give you a local context, political and social context of what it means to do such a study in, in our country. Then uh, a few comments on the key concepts that frame this study. A brief review of recent trends in critical EFL, EFL research and the bulk of the presentation will be devoted to discussing our data and our focus today is on the role of the teacher and something that will be coming back and forth to is uh, the, the, the position of, of the teacher in terms of what happens in terms of classroom dynamics. And then also we look at how both uh, teachers and students sort of reflect on what, uh, what gender and sexuality means, uh, what these categories mean to them in the process of both teaching and learning, and we wrap up with conclusions and recommendations. And um, right, uh, so um, we want to kick off with a quote from um, a report which was issued by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in 2012, uh, which says that equity and quality have to be, go hand in hand, right? You have to marry the two in order to um, arrive at um, uh, well, a high performing educational system. And we might be here teaching uh, or preaching to the converters, right? Because everybody knows it here, but still, uh, not even this report mentions uh, sexual uh, identity, right, as one of the factors which might influence um, uh, the uh, language attainment of students. Now, narrowing the perspective down with the same organization, with, with the report issued by the same organization in 2015. Uh, we want to draw your attention to a student based or student satisfaction survey uh, which evaluated the relationship, the satisfaction of the relationship between these students and their teachers, right? Uh, as you can see, there are uh, roughly about 30 countries uh, and Poland occupies or takes the honourable last position here. So this might be indicative of uh, things that are happening uh, in our country and, you know, the, of, of uh, all of the malign issues that are sort of easing away uh, at the educational system in Poland. Now, uh, why this might be happening? Um, sort of narrowing the perspective down to the social issues that uh, we've been encountering, we want to talk about moral panics. Moral panics concept which is introduced by Cohen um, to social sciences, but still present um, in the scientific discourse for over a century now. Uh, we want to talk a bit about gender ideologies as contrasted um, with uh, the ideology of gender. So we uh, think that there is something very idiosyncratic to it with regard to uh, the context of this uh, particular concept. So gender ideologies, I think most of us know what that is. Gender ideologies are the ideas of what women and men are expected to do, how they're expected to dress and behave towards one another in a given society, right? So this differs across societies, but this can also differ within one society. Now, the ideology of gender is something totally, totally different. It's a political construct which has made its way into the mainstream political, right-wing political discourse. And this concept was um, uh, was well, sort of triggered, uh, or the creation of this concept was triggered by the Catholic Church uh, in tandem with uh, right-wing politicians in Poland, and it encapsulate, uh, encapsulates all rivals right, in the post society from the perspective of the Catholic Church. So, uh, we've got sexualization of children, i.e. Uh, sexual education, uh, same-sex marriage, um, uh, the, uh, well, contesting or at least critically uh, reflecting on the stability of gender and sexuality within a given society, so on, so forth. Uh, now, uh, why do we deem that it's important with respect to our research? Well, for, uh, for, for, for example, some courses, some lectures had to be cancelled because of social protests in Poland, right? Uh, at least one uh, lecture uh, and one course component at our university. Um, also, um, some of my colleagues have uh, received uh, um, emails with uh, threats, right? Different sorts of. Um, while some lectures were cancelled, others um, were sort of uh, well delivered, but these lectures were deliv delivered by right wing quarters within <coughs> different universities. And for example, uh, just to give you a rough idea what these lectures uh, might be about, uh, the titles of them were Gender um, hyphen, Destruction of the Human and the Family. Question mark. Um, uh, there was another symposium. It's not funny. Uh, yeah, it's not really funny, but you know, we, we can laugh about it here, but it's, it's, it makes us cry 
that component. Uh, now, there was a, also a seminar in Krakow, right? A beautiful city, by the way, um, uh, which was entitled Gender, How to Defend Ourselves Against It, right? How can you defend uh, uh, yourself against your gender? Now, just to conclude this very brief introduction to the, po uh, to the sociopolitical si uh, situation in Poland, um, when we were submitting our report um, to the British Council, um, one of the schools, one of the primary schools in Poznań was uh, considering joining uh, the crusade against gender, right? Uh, and it was uh, participating, which was, um, uh, well, thinking about participating in a project which is entitled Family Friendly Schools, right? So they want to eradicate so, uh, sexual education and any sort of uh, diversity inclusive themes from the school. Um, mm -hmm. All right. Oops. Okay. So the key concepts that um, were uh, drawn on in, in our study, just to mention them, uh, gender and sexuality as social constructs, heteronormativity, the community of practice that again has been uh, very much taken advantage of in the area of language, gender, sexuality studies, not so much in the EFL context, and we find it absolutely very useful to account for uh, various gender dynamics emerging in, e in the e EFL classroom, and finally masculinities and femininities as uh, pluralized. Now, uh, there's been a, 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 a switch from looking at, uh, in, the in the EFL research, from looking at textbooks as being very powerful uh, to the role of teacher. And this is something that we'll be again reiterating um, uh, numerous times today. That is, what actually happens in the, in the classroom very much is not only mediated, but very often this is what we found controlled by the teacher. That is, he or she has, um, this sort of interactional power to direct certain discussions in a particular way or not to take up certain topics or to silence them. Now what it means to students, of course, it means that it empowers some of them, but of course at the same time disempowers uh, others. So we very like the quote of, uh, uh, put forward by Jane Sunderland back in 1994 who says that you, we can have the most non-sexist textbook, but it can become very sexist, to edit, in the hands of a teacher with sexist attitudes. And on the other hand, you might have a very progressive uh, textbooks, but uh, what is really done with it cannot really be predicted ahead of time. And this is what we, of course, found uh, in, in our research. So also to make a link to, Louis, sorry, to Louise's uh, plenary lecture, um, you are kind of looking at what can be done. I mean, how we can deal, you know, with deconstructing these, I mean, no gender and se uh, sexuality concepts, but we'll be actually looking at what is happening. So what is sort of state of the art, right? Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Right, so what we're interested uh, in particularly is the interaction within the classroom, right? Because we believe that the discourses which are evoked in the classroom can travel beyond it, can legitimize, can authorize uh, certain identities, can marginalize other identities. And this is basically something that uh, we deem uh, the most crucial component mm. of our, uh, of our uh, research, that is looking at the interaction which is of paramount importance for us. So as far as interaction is concerned, um, we've observed more than 47 lessons, but we've uh, audio recorded 47 lessons, which resulted in 35 hours and a quarter. Um, then we organized also three groups. Uh, as Asha said, we wanted to um, sort of uh, have uh, the perspectives of teachers and students incorporated into our uh, findings. Uh, and uh, these three sessions um, took roughly about 35 minutes each. Now, how about data analysis? What concepts, theoretical concepts, do we draw on? Well, first of all, there is this gender critical point introduced by Jane uh, Sunderland in 2002. Uh, criti gender critical, critical points are basically texts, right, or exercises within textbooks which feature uh, gender. Um, uh, gender which is manifested in a progressive or a traditional way, doesn't really matter, but gender has to be there, right? What we came up with in, in the course of our analyses uh, were three other um, uh, conceptual, uh, conceptual notions, that is gender triggered points, that is in class discussions, in class interactions, which were triggered somehow by the text, which does not have to be gendered. So we can imagine the text which is, um, uh, which is um, uh, not gendered right within, uh, in, the, in the textbook, but then the classroom interaction genders it. Uh, so the classroom participants draw on gender in order to understand it, in order to facilitate um, 
uh, possibly facilitate teaching. But when it comes to facilitate teaching and learning, uh, gender emerging points of, are of crucial importance. That is, um, uh, it's uh, gen evoking gender emerging points um, is at the hands of the powerful within the classroom, that is the teacher, right? So the teacher can divide um, classes into two uh, genders, right? They can uh, play with gender in order to um, in order to facilitate the understanding of a given, for example, grammatical notion, and Tasha will talk about it in a detail, uh, in a much more detail in a second. And there is also educational chit chat. I think that's uh, kind of self-explanatory. So let's move okay. On. So let's start with with uh, gender critical points. Um, we have an illustration from a textbook entitled Starland, uh, dedicated to the students of primary school. And uh, what we can see here is that students are asked to do the matching. That is, we have um, a, a number of jobs listed, accompanied by images. Um, and uh, even a cursory look, look at the pictures makes you aware that men tend, to function, men tend to function in these images in very agentic roles and women in quite communal, to use um, um, Eagle's terminology. So what we found is actually um, teachers did not somehow elaborate on the images, you know, asking questions. Okay, and and, and how about um, you know s uh, football? Uh, is is there any girl interested in football? I mean, doing anything with the gender representation. Um, but what we observed, however, is that uh, mm, gender triggered, uh, gender oriented discussion was triggered by certain text. And this is an example we're going to start with, um, which shows you a dialogue between an interaction between teachers and students based on a text called Family Life, and let's see what happened. All right, so let's, let's go. Um, um, I'd like us to, I mean, the, the discussion revolves around who does uh, chores at home. The teacher very much initiates here the questions, but let's start with um, line eight. So T stands for the teacher, S stands uh, for the students. Line eight, uh, do you clean the windows? Yagoda, it's a female name. Do you help your mom? So you can already see how it is assumed that there's this normative convention of, of women cleaning windows. And of course, Yagoda uh, should do that. Who helps their mom with cleaning the windows? So aga again, a kind of a normative assumption that is embedded to line nine. There is a response in number 10 by a student grandma. And in 9-11, you can see how this is sort of reinforced by the teacher with a number of interactional items here. Oh, grandma, yes. Um, we have three, two exclamation marks. Really, grandma, laughter, that's nice. So at the end, we have a very positive assessment. But then there is, uh, the kids are sort of silent. So the teacher goes again, um, uh, who cleans the windows, nobody? All right, Piotr, so there is a, a boy who gets uh, picked up. And he actually answers me. And that is very much challenge, line 12, line 14, who? You? Okay. I mean, using conversation analytic terminology, we would, of course, say that this is a repair as if the teacher has not really heard. The teacher heard um, without any problem that, that uh, Piotr said that this is actually him who does uh, uh, the cleaning and in in specific, more specifically cleaning the windows. Now, we're going to contrast this example, uh, not to kind of leave you with this pessimistic view, with another extract, although it's, it's entitled Mars and Venus Revisited. I think it gives us some different perspective. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, right. So, um, in the course of our research, we, um, uh, we sort of um, came up with the developed with the, the, this kind of very unprofessional terminology, right? We casted teachers into two groups uh, uh, the bad teachers, right? Ayanna reported on the bad teacher, and we also had the good teachers, right? And in the realm of academia, we also have good scholars and bad scholars. We've got good John Gray, right? Um, um, uh, the, the scholar working in our field, and we've also got this bad John Gray. And bad John Gray authored this book that is, uh, Men Are from Mars and women are from Venus, right? And this is actually a conversation that revolved around this extract from, uh, from this book, right? Um, so um, as you can see, the, the, the extract concerned um, house chores and um, um, gendered division of labor within the household, right? Uh, and the teacher, importantly, we actually don't have the time, so we want to concentrate on the most important bit. Uh, when the teacher gets to talk to uh, males and she actually gets them talking, right? Because they were initially very silent and not really mm. willing to cooperate. Um, then she says, hmm, okay, um, others, what's your experience in that case? Boys, do you participate in cleaning? 
And then there are students, maybe students saying, yes. Um, Who does the main job, she asks? Me and my brother. Sounds of surprise, right? A, a bit of laughter. But then what does she do with the laughter? She actually extinguishes it, right, by saying, you and your brother, okay, good, well done. Okay, so it does not fit the stereotype. Yes, okay. So she actually makes all of the voices come into the classroom. Right? She appreciates them, she validates them, and she's uh, really friendly towards other uh, non-stereotypical depictions of uh, gender roles. So uh, this is um, uh, why we want to quote Pavlenka at this point, uh, saying, who says that students whose voices are not being acknowledged in the classroom may lose their desire to learn the language or may even engage in passive resistance to classroom practices and curriculum demands. Mm -hmm. So we could see how it gets done at the interactional level, right? Mm -hmm. Or um, specifically in, uh, between the teachers and students. Okay, so um, uh, so far our uh, presentation has uh, proceeded uh, along the lines of um, the development of the field. So we talked about representation, right? So critical points, uh, critical gender points um, in, within textbooks, then um, text gender triggered points. We also want to talk about gender emerging points at this okay, point. Okay, so what is this mysterious gender emerging points or gendering the text? Now what we have uh, come across is that uh, very often teachers tend to draw on essentialist and binary notions of, of gender that is bounded femininity and bounded masculinity to what seems to us facilitate the process of teaching and learning a particular grammatical or lexical structure. So let me just give you an example, again taken from the textbook Starland for primary uh, school uh, uh, teachers. Now this particular exercise, exercise 10, was devoted to practicing a uh, second conditional, uh, quite uh, difficult structure to, to young children. And that uh, in the exercise, the kids were given prompts to be, to be completed. So if I were an animal, I'd be. If I were a flower, then I'd be. And if I were a color, and if I were a food item, of course, to be completed with uh, appropriate phrase. Now, what the students, what the teacher did, the teacher divided um, the class into boys and girls. And this is what the girls were to complete. If I were a flower, I'd be. And <laughs> boys, if I were a car, then I'd be. Of course, it, it, was, it was really interesting for us to kind of understand, you know, the kind of, I mean, we, we assumed what is the logic behind it, but then we brought up this point in the focus groups interviews and some of the answers we got were that uh, by the teacher saying that, uh, yeah, it, it's, it probably facilitates the process because kids are so familiar with it. So if you were given the girls, like, you know, if I were a car, first of all, it's a new grammatical structure for them, so that they would be struggling. And then, of course, a new kind of social scenario that they might not be very familiar with. Now, educational chit-chat and gender ideologies, they, al they also take on very special significance and regulatory function uh, because teachers uh, are perceived as authority, especially by very young children, but also there's a lot of peer pressure from, from fellow uh, students. But we actually found, and that was my first impression when I was not even recording the interactions, but you know, sitting on the classes, and I was thinking, you know, it's all so much gendered. I mean, this is just unbelie unbelievable from the entry point to the exit. So, uh, some of the examples. Um, from the primary school, uh, the, the examples were in Polish, the English equivalents were in English, but of course I'm giving you the English version. So what is a hard drive? This is too easy for boys. No gap, no overlap between the first bit and the second. Or talking about sports, uh, the word goal came up, so the teacher voiced the comment, oh, the boys should know this one. In high school, um, that was a very interesting class when they discussed whether it's better to take a loan and get an apartment or to actually uh, rent. It was a male student, uh, a male teacher who put down uh, a longer phrase, but we're just presenting you a bit of it. So uh, it says, you buy a flat, not a big one, just for you and your wife or your girlfriend. And at the same time, I could hear um, comments voiced both by uh, male, some of the male and some of the female students saying, or your boyfriend. And I think it was really interesting to see how these students construed the teachers a statement uh, both as sexist for some of them but also heteronormative so you know if I am a girl then I'm thinking that I might actually um, you know afford to buy a flat for myself and for my male partner for example but also being a gay student you might think about your partner as your boyfriend so this this reading was quite interesting Yes, uh, no, there's this very peculiar um, example of a teacher-preacher. This is how we questioned him. Um, and teacher-preacher um, had this very sort of um, annoying habit of disciplining everybody uh, on every occasion that he could. 
Uh, so, for example, when letting students into his classroom, he would say, ladies first, where's your manners, right? Uh, he would do that very, very often. Now, the second bit comes from um, one of his uh, mini lectures, right, that he used to give, that he gives probably, these days still are. Um, and um, he gives them during his classes. Unfortunately, he does that in Polish, right, probably to boost his ego. And what he does, he lectures all about M Mount Kościuszko, right, in, in Australia, but he also uh, sort of uh, draws on his personal uh, anecdotes. And one of such anecdotes uh, concerned uh, his reminiscing of his past holidays, right, when he w went abroad and he was traveling back to his hotel on the bus, uh, when he noticed that um, uh, his um, wallet had been missing, right? So uh, what he did was he naturally uh, went straight to the uh, reception desk and he called the bank. He wanted to um, uh, deauthorize any transaction that um, uh, could have been made on his card, on his debit card. Uh, now, he also accompanied it with, uh, complemented this observation with uh, the following remark, I ain't no old woman and don't put my pin uh, on my debit card, on the back of, at, the, at the back of my debit card, right? Uh, naturally, it uh, sort of evoked laughter in parts of students who uh, were not, who, because of the powerlessness, relative powerlessness, weren't allowed to simply um, uh, confront him about that, right? He was, so he was here operating on two vectors of oppression, right? He was both ageist and he was also sexist. Now, the last bit of our presentation before we uh, go on to conclusions concerns focus groups, and I'm just going to run through it. We had, yes, we had two uh, teachers groups and one student group. The uh, very uh, important and sort of uh, surprising uh, finding about teachers groups is that uh, we definitely uh, were anticipating very similar discourses, right? Uh, uh, to, to find very similar discourses in the course of uh, focus groups. We did not do that. There was just one overlapping discourse. Uh, right between the bad teachers and the good teachers, uh, we had the discourse of danger. We live in Poland, right? So everybody was very much uh, aware of the sociopolitical context and uh, how disempowered it made them, right? Uh, when if they wanted to raise any issues uh, regarding gender or sexuality, for the matter. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the conclusions. I know we're running out of time, but. Um, <laughs> We just uh, just gave you a few contrasting examples also. So on the one hand, we can see that there are teachers who tend to mm -hmm. very much draw on bounded femininity and masculinity who use gender to facilitate the process of teaching and learning. But in number uh, five, there are also those who conduct state-of-the-art socially informed classes. And of course, this is something uh, that we would like to follow up on to and, and see it as a, as a sort of a model. Um, well, generally, of course, students, um, and this is what came out in focus groups, would be happy to talk about non-normativities -normativ if safe space is um, provided. Now, in the final report, which should be available on the, on the British Council uh, website quite soon, you can also get to know a number of recommendations that we have, ma we have made for various stakeholders. The big question is, okay, so where does it lead us and what we should do with the findings? Um, think practically and look locally. It's the, the slogan, uh, the statement we like very much. So we're not talking about any country. We're talking about very specific local context where teachers do have their concerns, for example, about uh, losing their jobs if they you know, engage too much in talking about gender and sexuality. But one big recommendation that we have is for teachers to develop critical reflexivity, but also what Sri Kansarangi calls uh, reflection in practice, but also on practice. Now, in, in practice is that while you're producing a particular interaction, while you're engaged in a discussion, think what kind of realities, what kind of identities you are producing uh, for your students. Okay, I think I'm going to skip the final conclusion again from Aneta Pavlenko, uh, and uh, I'd like to thank you very much. Right, right. That we were using to analyze the classroom interaction data. Um, so I wondered what, what motivated you to choose those particular frameworks and also how it actually worked in mm -hmm. practice, applying 
Mm -hmm. It's different from cardiovascular assets. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mm, maybe that has not really come out in the presentation, but also depending on different stages of the project, um, definitely in the process of transcription, we were relying to a great extent on conversation analysis to kind of understand uh, the gender dynamics. But I think um, we had a sort of a general idea of qualitative methodology that we wanted to use. And then, you know, we started observing uh, various classes because there were four researchers and, you know, we were discussing the results and saying, Exactly, community of practice. This is, you know, this is something that absolutely allows us to to uh, explain what what you know what is happening. So it was sort of data driven very much. Okay, I mean, you, we kind of had this general idea, but uh, but uh, again, depending on w whatever came out. Uh, of course, we wanted to be very critical in the sense of you know understanding and shedding new light and deconstructing. So that's why we look at uh, critical. Uh, discourse analysis and with the feminist angle um, very much. So uh, I would say data driven and then um, depending what kind of mm, data uh, we, we collected. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you very much again. Okay, thank you.